Hello, I'm Pia Maria Torén and I'm the founder of Agile People. And today we will talk about diversity, psychological safety and conflicts in teams. There are many benefits of diverse teams over homogeneous teams. And if there is psychological safety, cognitive diversity can maximize collaboration conditions. We examine how working together can create more value when we have a trusting and safe team environment. What are the leadership qualities that become important here? And how can leaders contribute to creating a climate of healthy conflict? Read or listen to the chapters about psychological safety, increased diversity, and individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Diverse teams are generally more creative and solve problems more effectively than homogeneous teams uh, prone to groupthink. Diversity extends beyond age, race, language, national culture and religion into aspects such as neurodiversity, educational background and many others. Agile leaders embrace diversity and create environments where diverse teams can thrive. Teamwork starts with relationships between and among individuals. Instead of a culture of parallel experience within teams, leaders should focus on ways to build shared experiences. When diverse backgrounds contribute to a shared experience, the outcomes exceed what any group of individuals could have achieved on their own. Psychological safety is a fundamental prerequisite for high performance in teams. Under the right circumstances, conflict is often the catalyst for innovation. Why is it that a diverse team can create better solutions than a homogeneous team? Andrea Darabos is the author of the chapter about diversity and inclusion, and this is what she writes. I imagine a world where anyone, whatever their color, gender, race, or personality, can be their best authentic selves at home and at work. It doesn't matter where they are. The citizens of tomorrow will have plentiful access to opportunities for learning and contribute contribution. Everyone will have supportive role models and mentors to realize their dreams. They won't have to pretend to be anyone different than themselves at work. That I think is a very beautiful uh, imagination or dream, this kind of diverse world where everybody can be their authentic selves. So there is the traditional view of diversity that we usually think about when we hear the term. And in this course, we call it traditional diversity or demographic diversity. This includes race, religion, country of origin, gender, sexual orientation, disabilities, languages, and ages. The summary on the picture is a good one. Many of these are differences that are quite visible and we are constantly improving in the world how we include people who are different and see the advantages of mixing different people in teams in organizations. Some organizations take the topic very seriously and some still have a long way to go when it comes to this kind of diversity. Some companies say that they value diversity and then when you take a closer look at how they really work, this is not the case. There is a gap between the values and the way they actually work, which is what I usually call the structure culture misfit. Then we have another kind of diversity called cognitive diversity. This has more to do with the invisible differences that are not so easy to spot. This is about how our minds work, the biases we have, the values that we like, and a level of our basic needs and desires. View some of the movie clips to understand more about cognitive diversity uh, in the more material section in the campus. 
One guy in particular seems to stand out when talking about cognitive diversity, and that is Matthew Syed, who is particularly looking at cognitive diversity and the benefits that it can bring to strengthen individual team and organizational performance. The term neurodiversity refers to variation in the human brain regarding sociability, learning, attention, mood, and other mental functions. It was coined in 1998 by Australian sociologist Judy Singer, who helped popularize the concept along with American journalist Harvey Bloom. So there are different kinds of diversity and increasing diversity will actually in the end increase profits. As Andrea is writing in the Agile People Principles book, diversity and inclusion are often treated as nice to have or the right thing to do. In my opinion, they are much more than that. If you want to create a thriving organization where learning, creativity, and teamwork are front and center, you will need to make all aspects of diversity and inclusion front and center on your leadership agenda. Organizations and leaders who are willing to move out of their comfort zone will acquire new perspectives, inspiration, and true customer empathy they will develop the collective resilience necessary to weather the storms of the 21st century. There are also two chapters in the book covering the topic of building shared experience, and that is a collective intelligence uh, by Mikael Jötte and cross-functional teamwork by Wout der Back. We have already talked about the importance of working in small cross-functional teams, and it's also how we work that can help to build a shared experience. There are different levels of co collaboration and pair working is one way of making sure that we co-create and use our minds in the best possible way. You can do almost anything in pairs. You can develop, coach, manage, etc. Bonita Roy is the creator of something called open participatory organizations who have the least possible amount of structures, rules and boundaries and everything can work in a fluent manner where you can move in and out of different areas in a seamless manner and use the collective intelligence to solve business problems. She says that performance is about creating customer value in the end, and this increases exponentially the closer you collaborate. If we have a look at the figure on this uh, picture, we see that coercion is more I force you to do it. Compliance is when I tell you what to do. Coordination is someone coordinating work be, be, being done in different places and domains separately. Cooperation is when we work together. And if I buy you lunch, you buy me lunch the next time. So it's a kind of transactional relationship. Collaboration, now we are getting closer to, to what we're really talking about. This is working on the same task at the same time in the same space. Co-creation, the highest level of collaboration, is to create together. We don't know who created what part in the end. And uh, you can read more from Bonita Roy. In um, I interviewed her for my first book. So the interview has been added as a PDF in, in, in the campus where you can read more from her. The Agile People Manifesto was created in this co-creation manner during four days in June 2019. It was four days of working, reworking, learning, unlearning, doing, redoing, arguing, celebrating, throwing away, taking back 19 persons from 15 countries. And in the end, we agreed about one Agile People Manifesto that you can find on agilepeoplemanifesto.org. And you can also find it in the flipbook. Having been through such a process together makes you have something to build on for the future, a shared common experience that could serve as a platform for the people involved. 
At this point in this training, I almost find it superfluous to talk about cross-functional teamwork, as we have been through in, in depth the importance of different skills, competencies, perspectives, and mindsets to create more, earlier, and better customer value. I reference again Wouter's chapter with the same name, cross-functional teamwork. But, you know, repetition is the mother of skill. So it takes time to build shared experience. But when you reap the benefits, you realize that it's all worth it in the end. High performing teams have all been through a lot together. And if you never argue or allow a healthy amount of conflict on the team, my conviction is that you are not yet high performing. The best teams emerge from many challenges and healthy disagreement, and sometimes maybe even not so healthy disagreements. A common purpose is a very strong glue that will keep people trying again and again, not giving up at the first setback. As I always say, you have not failed until you stop trying. What if conflicts are destroying team performance? We're going to talk now about conflicts between team members and how you can work to help people to solve this. There are different types of conflicts and the goal is not to completely avoid or remove conflicts. There are constructive conflicts and not so constructive ones. Looking at this image, we can see that there is a conflict continuum where we have artificial har harmony at one end and destructive personal attacks at the other end. In the middle, we have the sweet spot where we have just enough of con constructive conflict to stimulate new ideas and to build on each other's. Instead of, of uh, attacking different views, it is, is uh, very easy to fall into the artificial harmony trap. And the fact is that most companies uh, find themselves on that end of the scale. We need uh, to have the courage to move in the, in, in the direction of more and more and more conflict until we get to the point where if we moved one step further, we would cross over to the yellow side of destructive personal attacks. We need to be able to live just there, balancing between artificial harmony and destructive personal attacks, where we can have different opinions. People can say what they think, but we don't cross over to personal attacks. Then we optimize our innovative capacity. We have some concepts when it comes to um, navigating and resolving conflicts. And it, the first one I'm going to bring up here is cold and hot conflicts. Uh, cold conflicts is when people don't speak and try to avoid each other. Maybe they are not even admitting that there is a problem. A hot conflict on the other hand is when people are heavily engaged in the conflict in an outspoken way. You can't really miss that there is a conflict if it's hot. They many times express themselves strongly and hostile and don't try to hide that they are angry or upset. Before being able to solve a conflict, it needs to be hot. So a cold conflict needs to be turned into a hot one. People must admit that there is a conflict and express their different opinions openly. And only then, the conflict can be solved. Escalation is your enemy when it comes to conflict handling. Conflicts escalate through a number of stages. And in the last stage, people don't care if they hurt themselves as long as they hurt the other part too. And that's a dangerous place to be. Compare this with suicide bombers. If a conflict tends to get worse, you need to try to change the direction and move the other way. Common goals is one way to focus on what both parties want in the end, the vision that we both share. Uh, the conflict often lies in the difference in the details, the how. So if we focus on the why and the goals, we have better chances of finding a common path moving uh, towards the why. Perspective taking is probably the super skill to navigate healthy conflict. 
the trap that leads to interpersonal conflicts is thinking we are right and they are wrong. If we can understand where other people are coming from, even if we don't agree with them at all, we can better separate the person from the issue. One small coaching exercise is, for example, the following. How does this look like for you in the first perspective? What are you seeing, feeling, hearing and thinking? Imagine that you now are the other per person. We call that the second perspective. How might they be seeing this feeling, hearing and thinking? Now imagine if you could zoom out of both of these perspectives and be a fly on the wall, looking at those two people having a disagreement. What behaviors are you seeing and what kind of language are you hearing? With this insight from the second and third perspective, if you now zoom back into yourself, the first perspective, how might you change your approach? An excellent tool to uh, go beneath um, the surface and be able to better imagine how the other person might be perceiving this, what they may be feeling and what they may be wanting are the RIS basic needs, the RIS motivation profile that we have talked about before. Two key benefits here are that you understand better that the other person is different from you and that you get a better language to talk to the other person about what their needs might be. As always, as leaders, we need to know when to call in professional help um, to, to solve the conflict. A very good wake-up call is if we ourselves in a leading role are involved in the conflict, then we might be a big part of the problem. In which case, uh, bring in an outsider to help. And this is all for today. Thank you very much.